All right, welcome back. And um, this will take us till the end of the show. And we're saying with the economy, a lot of stuff has been happening. Um, comments um, made by the governor of Edo State on the printing of, of money, which was distributed among the states, uh, did raise a lot of um, dust. And there have been reactions even from the central bank saying, no, it did not happen. But it still sparked conversation also, too, because even as yesterday, uh, there have been concerns from the former governor of the central bank, Sanusi Lamido uh, Sanusi, about uh, the country's external debt to revenue profile, 400% in 10 years. And it's something people have talked about uh, for a long while, that this is um, the elephant in the room and, you know, could, could spell doom for the country's economy in the years to come. But not to raise the alarm and everything, uh, we having the discussion this morning with fantastic resource persons uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Austin Uwezere is with the Pan-African University. It's great to have you join us this morning um, on News Hub. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. Uh, I'm sure um, you smile some more when you realize um, also with you on, on, the, on, the, on, on this virtual interview is um, Dr. Milafi Obadaya. Uh, Dr. Milafi Obadaya is a former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Great to have you join us this fine morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. So, um, yes, let's proceed, uh, David. Beautiful conversation we'll be having this morning. Uh, our esteemed gentlemen on the other side. Uh, we titled this conversation the Rising Debt Profile, uh, the Economies of um, Currency Printing, uh, which of course speaks to uh, the latest uh, announcement by the governor of Edo State, uh, Gordon Obaseki, when he alarmed that um, 60 billion naira was printed by the federal government. Uh, to augment uh, the FAC allocation for the month of March. A very disturbing uh, uh, you know, announcement there by the governor of Edo State. Let's look at the whole concept of currency printing. I want to start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Obadiah. Of course, you, are, you have been with the regulator over the years, so you probably understand the concept and the principles of currency printing. Bring us up to speed when it is extremely inevitable uh, for a country to begin to look at printing currencies. Well, um, I don't know where to start. I, I used to be with the regulator. Uh, I'm no more with the regulator. Um, but, you know, we still have a kind of esprit de corps. Um, you know, we don't go about attacking them unnecessarily unless uh, extreme follies have been committed. Um, part of the role of a central bank uh, is to print money, uh, quite simply. And uh, it is a universal principle of central banking that no central banking can ever get broke. Uh, that is their exorbitant, exorbitant privilege, uh, the privilege to print money. But it must be exercised with the highest responsibility. That is, you don't print unnecessarily. Uh, you don't print just to fulfill political expectations. You know, uh, during the peak of the military period, I believe during the Babangida era, uh, one chief, uh, Falegan, uh, actually wrote an article and in an interview in which he said, you know, uh, the military were ordering them to just print and print and print. And they'll bring trucks, pack them off, and use them really to settle, uh, you know, political people and so on. And if you run a central bank like that, you're going to run it aground, and you run the economy aground, and you can see what happened uh, during those days. The Naira was bastardized. The whole economy was in ruins. Uh, I mean, not even Idi Amin, even Idi Amin of Uganda. He was careful uh, not to behave like that, you know, surprisingly. Uh, I do not know the evidence for what uh, uh, Obase, Governor Obaseki made that statement. Uh, but my suspicion is that uh, over so many years, with the so-called intervention funds, you ask yourself, where is the money coming from? I mean, it runs into trillions of naira. Uh, you know, it's not subject to, uh, you know, appropriation 
by the National Assembly. And yet trillions and trillions have been churned out in the name of interventions. Uh, true, we are hearing that there are rice pyramids. Uh, and I don't know why pyramids need to be, uh, rice need to be put in a pyramid. Uh, you know, but uh, at what cost? You know, uh, we are getting self-sufficient in rice, but you ask yourself, at what cost? If you are spending 500 billion to produce a result of 400 billion, then you are being uh, penny wise and pound uh, foolish. So my advice is we must be very careful. Uh, it looks as if the fiscal side has major challenges. In a time of pandemic, uh, not enough revenues are coming into government coffers uh, and let us be very, very honest. This government is not an economy friendly government. They've ruined the country, they've ruined the economy. They, you know, they've left banditry and terrorism to get completely out of hand. You know, in such an atmosphere, confidence will be at a discount. Uh, obviously, it reaches a point where the government has no choice than to print money. Uh, that is the most dangerous stage of all. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Milafia, let's, let's speak to Dr. Weze next up. Um, Dr. Dr. Weze is, is a big talking point, and whether or not um, uh, the governor's claims are right or wrong, the CBN has come out to deny it. But in your thinking uh, about the printing of currency and the dangers and the pros and cons, let's get your reaction to it. Well, it's, um, you know, the CBN is in the business of printing money and also um, making sure there is stability. And over the years, they have been doing inflation targeting you know, fighting inflation, using the Naira to defend it and the currency and all that. Uh, but all this have been, um, uh, you know, the printing of the currency is uh, part of their job, but for what intent and purpose, uh, that's the point. Uh, don't forget that this is not the first time and they can print money for different reasons. Maybe the currency in the market is dirty, they want a new currency to, you know, they can print to change the circulation, you know, of uh, uh, the currency that's circulating in the marketplace. And, uh, you know, uh, economists uh, call this kind of thing um, high powered money, you know, where, you know, because high powered money is uh, a measure of money supply to the system. You know, when, when that happens, you know, like the printing of this money now, uh, the first thing that will happen is that inflation definitely will, um, will go up in nature. You know, there's always, there has to be a need for a balance in economics and for equilibrium, okay? So uh, once we are able to achieve balance, you know, that equilibrium position in the economy, then um, the economy will be, at, you know, will be balanced. But, you know, printing, even uh, when NMPC, for instance, bring in uh, brings in the, uh, the foreign currency from sale of oil. The central bank used to also print money, Naira equivalent to it, and they keep the currency and share the uh, Naira, you know, in the, um, you know, to the, uh, to you know, those that are supposed to receive it, with two states. So it has a negative impact on the, on the economy. And uh, again, if you're printing money for expenditure to pay your bills, I think uh, that shows that uh, you know the economy has actually collapsed, so it's about to collapse. You know, as somebody, some group of people predicted, uh, I think 2020, 2019 or 2020, that the a time will come where Niger where Nigeria will not be able to pay, federal government will not be able to pay salaries, and um, you know, and it's happening now for them to print. That shows that the prediction. Uh, you know, it's, it's a bit, they're accurate in their predictions. So it's, uh, it's a sign that the weak, the fiscal side, the fiscal policy side is weak, terribly weak. And that's why they're using the monetary side to solve that kind of uh, problem. If um, the, the, um, 
the fiscal side is uh, strong enough, they should give direction to the monetary side, which CBN represents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but we don't see much things coming in from uh, the fiscal policy side. You know, and uh, how do they generate enough money to take care of without going about printing it? You know, so it's it's uh, we Nigeria is in a precipice, and um, we need people to put on their thinking caps to be able to. Um, uh, bring out the economy from this doldrum, uh, because if we continue like this, uh, that's a total collapse of the economy, and uh, it's, it's uh, too bad. Unemployment will rise, factories will be will not be coming, um, you know, the food capacity, you know, and um, you know, so many things will go wrong. Even banks cannot lend uh, long term. It's short term thinking that will be going on all the time. So um, it's, it's, it's quite unfortunate that we're experiencing this. But there's nothing wrong with printing money. There's nothing wrong, but it depends on what you use that money for, okay? So that is just the, the point. And um, if we keep at it and begin to think more, more creative in the management of the economy, I think we can get around it, in, in a, in, you know, we can get around it. It's never too late, uh, but we really need to put our thinking cap. And that's what, you know, the present situation has not uh, done and we need to really do that yeah there's nothing we can come out of debt even if we need to print as suggested by the rwandan president to print money to pay external debts because debt burden is so heavy so if you know you can print why borrow why borrow to pay debts i know so you know if you can if you can you know i have yet to think of uh, what he suggested the African countries should actually print money to pay off their debts, you know, and there's a sense in that, okay? So even though there's a short-term implication to that, but the longer term, it, because if your debt profile is high, it's a, it's a huge burden. So it's, it's for you, our, you know, to reduce your debt so that you'll be able to manage yourself, you know, live within your means and manage your situation to be able to, uh, you know, solve the societal problems uh, and right, go, uh, go uh, into Dr. more productive Dr. Uh, uh, sector. <laughs> yes, Dr. Yes. Austin, let's 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 just hold your thoughts there uh, one one minute. Whilst you were talking, we're being joined in the studio uh, by a guest. Yes, um, Justin Chuku is the MD CEO of Amkari Asset Management Limited. And uh, whilst you were talking, I did see him. Uh, you know, he reacted, and I would like to know exactly uh, the reason why he reacted the way he did react. But once again, Johnson Chiku, welcome to News Up. Thank you, David, for having me. Yes. Um, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Doc. And there's also Mila Fia. Yeah, good well, good to see you. Mila oh, Mila it's interestingly, both of them are my friends. Eh? Okay. So both of them are dogs. So, yeah. so let's 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 start up. Let's pick it up from where uh, Dr. Austin stopped. You you did disagree with um, a position that he was expressing there. Yes, the, por the a, a portion of his statement that I disagree with is that you should, you can print to pay your debt. Uh, when you print to pay your debt, you are going to increase the volume of uh, money in the economy without a commensurate increase in productivity. productivity. And you could lead to hyperinflation. It simply means those who have lent, assuming you want to print to pay your local currency debt, because maybe what you were referring to is payment of local for, currency for, debt. For, yeah. You can't print to pay your foreign for currency you. debt. Okay. The, your foreign currency debt has to be paid from earnings of foreign currency uh, revenue or foreign currency cash flow. So you can't print your local currencies because you can't print foreign currencies. Nigeria cannot print dollars. Yeah. So you can print money to pay your foreign currency debt. If you print one trillion naira to buy dollars, dollar, the value of dollar will only increase to that by that magnitude. And it does not give you access to foreign currency earnings or foreign currency cash flow. You can only pay your foreign currency debt from foreign currency ca uh, cash flow. Cash flow. So you can't pay it from foreign currency, uh, local currency debt, uh, pr uh, currency printing. But secondly, even if you want to print your local currency to pay local currency debt, what you do, you destroy your economy because you're going to have a situation where the vol volume of currencies in the economy will be so much that you could have hyperinflation. And then people will lose confidence in your economy and your local investors will even no longer be interested in investing in your economy. Mm -hmm. you, we've seen that happen in countries like Zimbabwe and some of these countries. So the key thing is that every 
quality pro uh, printing should be backed by product increase in productive activities. And that's when you are able to maintain your uh, exchange rate or the value of your credit as well as maintain right. your inflation rate. So, or sorry, keep your inflation Chico. rate low. So, sorry, Johnson. We'll go, we'll go take a quick break. and we come back, we we'll continue our discussion uh, this rise in debt profile and what has happened. Just stay with us. Breaking news stories, insightful documentaries, news reports from around the globe, and original news content. Now available 24 hours daily on Star Times Channel 109. Stream live on YouTube at www.youtube.com forward slash Silverbird N24 Live. Follow on Facebook at Silverbird News 24, on Twitter at Silverbird N24, and on Instagram at Silverbird N24. Silverbird News 24, the news never stops. You can now stream Silverbird News 24 live on mobile app. All you need to do is to download Silverbird News 24 app from Google Play Store on your Android devices and App Store or on your Apple devices. Tap the live button at the bottom bar to watch us live 24-7. You can enjoy all our news programs including PG News and Program. Silverbird News 24. The news never stops. Oh, welcome back, and um, big discussion we're still having here on the economy. Um, John Sinchuku, financial analyst, um, Badaya Melaf here, former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, and Dr. Austin Wesley, who is with the Pan-African University. Let's get to Dr. Melafi Obadia Obadaya, um, former deputy governor of the Central Bank. Um, I remember very well that the, the Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, had once been asked whether we had a problem with the debt um, numbers as it was beginning to rise, and she, she said the problem was with the revenue and not with the debt. Uh, but then, um, stay in the honestness yesterday, uh, a former colleague of yours, I'm sure, uh, governor of the central, former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, did paint a, a picture where we've seen the debt to revenue ratio run from 10% all the way uh, to over 400% in the last 10 years. And people are beginning to raise concerns about just what exactly is happening uh, with the debt. And it, it does appear that the revenue problems uh, facing this administration uh, is bigger than it was envisaged in terms of how we're going to get the monies to run the different projects which have been earmarked in the 2021 20, uh, uh, budget. Uh, Dr. Milafia. You know, as I listened to you, what you said about the Honorable Minister of Finance saying there's no debt problem, there's a revenue problem, reminds me of a man who went and borrowed a hundred million from the bank purportedly in the name of the business, but he used the money to marry more wives. And when he had more children to feed and so on, he ran into a lot of difficulty. When the banks came for him, he said, no, it's, it's not a problem of money. It's just that I have too many more mouths to feed now and so on uh, and so forth. So this is the kind of thinking that is, is dangerous. Uh, let us just go back to history. Uh, and in these things, I don't want to behave like some of these people. You leave an organization and uh, you have nothing to do, so you keep picking at everything they do wrong, and you know, it becomes a career move. I, I hate to be in that kind of position, and I'm not like that, you know. So when they do good, I, I praise them. When when they do something completely foolish, uh, I frown at it. Uh, but I'm not in the business of every day. Uh, breathing down the neck of my former colleagues to see everything doing that is wrong and so on. And so, but let's just look at the history. By 2005, our debt was $36 billion. 
and we were crying. We were spending something like five billion every year to service the debt, not even the principal, to service the interest. Because Abacha during his time refused to pay, so the interest was accumulating and it reached a position where we were, you know, getting very insolvent. Most of our earnings were going to pay debt. So Obasanjo, President Olusegun Obasanjo, in his wisdom, decided that we had to bite the bullet. And at that time, Ngozi Okondi Wala was his Minister of Finance. And they went around, met the Paris Club, met everybody, and we had a protracted period of negotiations. Uh, in which at the end of the day, the Paris Club agreed to write off our debt as long as we could pay uh, part of it, almost something like half of it. It was terrible. And I, I, I remember I was acting for the, for the governor at that time, and I had to sign the first tranche of payment. I think I, found, I signed something like $7.5 billion. And I can tell you that day I caught fever. And, uh, you know, you, you sign $7.5 billion. It's not Naira, you know? Even Naira, that's a lot of money. But you, you sign it away to some banks in Switzerland. And this is the people's money. You have to just pay it. But we had to do it. Uh, and at the end of the day, we had a clean slate to start with. And we paid in total something like $20 billion for the Paris Club to now... Uh, forgive us the rest of the debt. That is about uh, sixteen billion dollars, uh, and uh, and then to start from a clean slate. So, and, and they gave us a condition. One of the fundamental conditions was that everything else that we were saving from that debt servicing in the past, we must use it for poverty alleviation. This is something fundamentally that I disagree with. Poverty is a symptom, not the disease. And we were fighting the symptoms rather than the underlying disease. You don't tackle it by throwing money around. That's how you tackle poverty. You tackle poverty by a program of mass agro-based industrial transformation that creates jobs and expands the possibility frontiers of production and competitiveness. That is how you address those issues. So it, it was a fraud from beginning to end. Uh, if, if we were only to be forgiven, only for now to use the money to throw around, you know how politicians are. Tell them, oh, it's about poverty alleviation, palliatives, then they know what to do. You know. So today, however, our debt has come back to about $84 billion. I know that a huge chunk of it is, is still uh, domestic rather than foreign. Uh, uh, but it, a, a debt is a debt, and you have to pay it back one way or the other. So the debt has accumulated, uh, and a lot of our debts now are owed not to the multilaterals. In the past, it was mostly to the multilaterals and to bilaterals. And that is why the Paris Club had to settle it. But a lot of the debts we are owing today are more commercial. You know, uh, from, you know, we've raised uh, FGN bonds internationally. We've also raised what they call Sukuk bonds uh, and, and the rest of it. Uh, and uh, so, and I'm from the Chinese, huge amounts from the Chinese. And I'm told the Chinese love to lend to Africans uh, because of the back kicks that happen. You know, the World Bank will ever give you that. The Americans will ever give you any yeah, back kicks. And anybody who collects them will be jailed. So the white people know this, but the Chinese are ready to play ball. And that is why they can get huge loans. And you ask yourself, where is the money going? What is it financing? Look at Mambila. We're even having a court case in Paris now for breach of contract. They collected loans of billions of dollars for Mambila. No single block, I'm told, has been laid in Mambila. And most foolish of all, one of the first loans we took in 2015, when this president came to power, the first time he went to the United States, 
we collected $1.3 billion IDA loan from the World Bank purportedly for reconstruction and rehabilitation in the Northeast. And when you go to the Northeast, there is nothing to show for it. Yes, so uh, it is very alarming. Doc, doc, it is doc, very disturbing. Doctor Milafia, extremely very, very disturbing. I, I, I did, I did get a report from the uh, the Bureau of Statistics a couple of days back, putting our, our current debt profile at um, uh, thirty-three uh, trillion trillion naira. Uh, I stand corrected, because Justin Chiku. About, about that. And you know, how much is that, that in is dollars? What we how are much is faced with dollars? right now. Which, which brings me to my next question, which borders around um, uh, debt management in, in Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Austin, uh, quickly, how would you think that this government or governments over the years have, should have managed uh, 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 the nation's debt? Uh, because uh, as we speak, we, we find ourselves. Uh, paying so much uh, for debt servicing while uh, the principal still remains. And then we're looking at uh, uh, a largely dwindling uh, revenue, which further compounds uh, uh, the concerns of a repayment of this debt. Bring us up to speed. How do you think our debt could have been managed a lot more properly? The, um, the point is that in the history of borrowing in Nigeria has always been for consumption. And there is no way you borrow money to consume that you can actually pay back, you know, in the normal sense of it. You know, there is nothing wrong, I keep saying this, there's nothing wrong with borrowing. I give you some countries that are borrowed for specific purposes. One is, um, you know, um, Northern Ireland. Some years ago, uh, they needed to build an uh, a, a ICT city. They borrowed money and invested everything there. And then the revenues from that project was used to pay back the loan, okay? Now, Spain, a few years ago too, borrowed money, the southern part of Spain was like a slump, like a, a better, you know, our own Ajegunle, you know? And they needed to revive the city and then industrialize it. They borrowed money and turned that place to a beautiful industrial city today. And the jobs are being created, you know, um, the taxes are being collected, and uh, the monies are being paid back if they haven't finished paying. But for us, once it comes to free money, because that's what it is, free money to them, you know, borrowing is like free money. They don't use it for the purpose it's being borrowed for. And when you borrow money to pay salaries for consumption, basically, there's, it's not good for the economy. And that has been the way they, we have not been able to manage the uh, our debt profile very well. You know, when we borrow for a particular investment, you borrow to invest. So when you invest, you now save. And that's why, you know, even during the uh, sovereign wealth fund issue that some governors have objected to and all that, we argued that. Once this money is for the borrowing, we borrow, we invest, and the monies can be used. We put aside some for, for the future. Okay? So that's the thing. There's no way you can save money without, the, first of all, investing. So the, you borrow money, you invest, then you save. That's the best way to manage this debt profile. There's absolutely nothing wrong with borrowing. But we must borrow to invest. Then we can save then the economy, when you need that savings, you can apply it back into the economy to solve one social or economic problem or the other. So that is one thing that we have not been able to, to do. You know, every government that comes to power to borrow, and then even in the, in the Obas and Just time, you know, and you know what most people don't know that after Obas and took over his first stanza in uh, 1978 or so, uh, 76, rather, you know, that he, after his first tax 77, he borrowed money, which was part of the thing that the first time he borrowed money, because the one told us that Nigeria has so much money that his problem was how to spend it. And then Ambassador John came and showed us how to spend that money by organizing first tax 77, and all this money <laughs> spent. After first tax 77, the the white paper of Gazette of February 
1978 or thereabouts, the money was, uh, I mean, Obasanjo borrowed, uh, I don't know, I've forgotten the actual amount he borrowed, right. but that money accumulated, which was part of what he paid back today. I mean, when, before he left office as president. Right. So we need to understand the concept of borrowing. When you borrow, you invest, and then you save. All That's right, the Dr. best Wazer. management I can think of. Right, Dr. Wazer, thank you very much. And, and a great reminder also, too, for the years we've had so much money in court and um, not knowing what to do with it. Uh, Johnson Chuku here. Uh, big, big, big talking point around um, just how to get the money, first of all, to deal with the capital project. Even for the capital projects, money to even pay out just the salaries, which is a huge problem. I remember the last NBS report I saw around uh, just how many states were making as much money from the IGR that they collected from FAC. More than 30, 28 to 30 states were getting just 25% of that. Just five or six states could survive on their IGR alone if they're going to take the IGR and then pay up uh, salaries for the worker. So it's a double whammy for them. They can't, don't have money to pay salaries. How much more money to carry out capital projects or every move like uh, Dr. Nwese is talking about in terms of what to do. But what, 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 do you, what do you think? People are asking the question, where's the money going to come from? You're going to have to keep borrowing to pay salaries, it looks like, in the short term at least. Well, the way I would look at it is where, where would the money come from is that <clears throat> we need to look at our structure. There's always this, uh, there's this colloquial saying in Africa that you cut your coat according to your size, oh. which has been modified that you cut your coat according to your materials <laughs> or the size of your materials the cloth, yeah. <laughs> uh, or the size of your clothes. So, um, the cloth here will be the population. Yeah, the, 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 this likely, this right? is why we have continued to live with the uh, very strange and abnormal fiscal framework or structure at the state levels or subnational levels because the subnationals are not accountable. Uh, they go cap in hand every month to the federation account to collect um, allocations. Uh, governments at the subnational level do not are not necessarily compelled to live within their means. So like a place like America where we practice true federalism. And people are asking for true political federalism, but we're not looking at the true fiscal federalism. Right. If you really have to practice true <coughs> fiscal federalism, a state government will have to restructure its uh, bureaucracy to be in tandem with its revenue. And again, a state government will be compelled to do the appropriate investment that will attract private sector investment into their e economies. In other countries of the world where you have true federalism, governors go out to seek for investors to their states. And how do you do that? You build infrastructure to support investment in your states. You have the appropriate rules and regulations to support investment in your state. You maintain the best or highest level of security in your state to make sure your investors come to your, your, your state. As way in the world, if a private sector business operator wants to set up in a state, the governor will actively woo the private sector investor. And when a private sector investor identifies where he or she wants to locate his industry, in most places they will build roads to take uh, to that factory, and then they will supply light to that factory, and then the factory will employ people, and they will earn their tax revenue from the pay-as-you-earn income of those employees. There will be multipl multiplicity of economic activity that will drill down from that factory, including indirect jobs that will be created within the state. Which, sorry, David, which, yeah. which will, will get you on this point. I, I remember now you have talked about, if, if for example, look at a country like Nigeria, um, poverty, uh, unemployment rate, 33%. You want people to work. You want to in, in, increase the economy and increase the activities of, around the economy. And you give people money through this printing of money. You give them money so they can then be able to purchase. And if they can purchase, it means that they can expand the production of goods and services, which means the companies can, you know, um, the, the companies can produce more. And if they produce more, it means that they have to employ more people. So the employment is dealt in a certain way. I, I know this is a bit idyllic in the way I'm thinking, but does this, what Dr. Waze, for example, says, solve the problem of saying, for example, nothing wrong in printing money to, so that people can have money to pay for items? And because of that, you will have increased jobs being made available for people. Okay, um, it's interesting because um, I had a conversation similar to that, not exactly uh, the way you presented it. You see, there is what you call stimulus, which government give to restart the engine of economic activities. And the engine of economic activity could be disrupted and grind your heart, which is the kind of thing that happened as a result of COVID-19, or some 
catastrophic economic activity that could lead to economic crisis, and then employment is lost, people are out of jobs, people do not have income, so there's no consumption, economic activity begins on a downward slope, and then you have an economic recession. And then the government will step in to restart the wheel of economic activities. And that restarting could come in the form of either they go in the public works, employ people, pay them, and those people will earn income and then resume consumption as they place orders for goods and services, the people who have just been employed by government. These companies will now demand for labor to produce those goods. And the, the people they have employed to produce goods will earn income and demand for more goods and services. And then as demand for good, more goods and services will trigger demand for more labor. Yeah. And then demand for more labor will demand, trigger, trigger demand for more consumption and demand for more labor. So economic activities resume good. and then you can, you can start your economic will through that route. Right. You can also have situation where, like in advanced countries, where there's, there are not so many opportunities for public works. Right. So they give financial handout to the citizens, so citizens can resume consumption. And they resume consumption, the demand for goods and services, those companies will demand for labor, right. and then employment will be restarted. Right. So the key thing is that the approach you use to restart your economy when there is economic crisis depends on the peculiarities of your economic situation. In a country, in a developing country like ours, public works should be the route. The government doesn't even have the way with that to do handouts. And you also recognize the fact that, look, in Nigeria's peculiar situation, consumption is not largely domesticated. Consumption triggers demand for importation or a demand for foreign exchange and import, imported goods. Because in a, an economy like the U.S., the basic consumption for those blue-collar uh, workers will be uh, made locally. And in such situation, once you trigger consumption, you're going to trigger economic activities. Now, we have one peculiarity which we have to, in designing our economic approach or intervention approach, yeah. we have to take it to cognize those challenges. If you give hand, cash handouts, the likelihood that people will become frivolous, they will just consume or buy foreign made goods, and then you do not have trapped the benefit of that additional stimulus in your economy, economy is there. But that does not take, but if you use the public work approach, mm -hmm. you're going to employ people who their basic needs will be food, clothing, rent. So those things are produced domestically. Right. And then you realize that it, for me, my own pers uh, perspective, that it is more effective to trigger economic recovery by government engaging in public works, build roads. The impact of that road will have multiplier effects on the economy. Build bridges. Build the seaports, okay? Build housing units. And then they employ so many people to come and do those jobs. And those people will be paid, and then they will get it, take the income they earned to go and demand for basic food items, basic clothes, rent, and stuff like that. Okay, Joshua Jekyll. So, 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 so much still needs to be said. Uh, but let's, let's, move, let's move on to Dr. Obadiah and Dr. Austin. Uh, let's have their closing remark because um, our time is fast running out. Uh, Dr. Obadiah, uh, your parting shots. There is um, a strong need uh, to reflect uh, this economy. Uh, as Pastor said, um, the economy is, um, is dipping by the minute, dipping by the minute. Uh, what exactly would you want to suggest as a quick fix uh, for the nation's economy? The need to reflect the economy as we stand. Well, thank you. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I agree with what uh, my friend and uh, brother Johnson said. I mean, public works is one one way to go, and, uh, and the huge infrastructure needs the need to, for rural roads and so many things. You know, uh, we can get a lot of young people involved in that. Uh, of course, we need massive investments uh, in, in key sectors of the economy. And also, we need to, to tame the evil monster of insecurity. It destroys confidence in the economy uh, and the rest of it. And uh, quite frankly, the central bank of today is not one that I easily recognize. Uh, I think it has become uh, a victim of political capture in many ways. They are pandering more to political interests than the real needs of the economy. And please let me correct you. I mean, I was talking about the data on debt, and I said, the total debt is about $84 billion. And somebody corrected me and said, no, it is, <laughs> it is $32 trillion. 
what is the difference between 32 trillion and 84 billion? Uh, you were quoting it in Naira, I was quoting it in, uh, in, uh, in dollars, but it is the same thing if you go to DMO, latest DMO data. Uh, the issue is that the external component is now about 31.9 uh, billion dollars uh, as the external component, whereas the, the internal component is about 55 billion, far more than the external. But even the external is almost coming back to where we were in, in 2005. So when you add the two together, you get about 84 billion, 84, 85 billion which is the same as 32 uh, trillion uh, Naira. So I think going forward, we need to go back and focus on the fundamental needs of this economy. The need to bring down inflation, uh, the need to be more focused with regard to monetary policy, the need to expand the tax base, not increase it, expand it, get everybody involved uh, and don't keep it too high because you will discourage investment activities. Uh, and of course, greater prudence in the management of the small that we have, cutting down wastes and focusing on jobs, investments, uh, and building uh, a robust economy that, uh, you know, uh, can provide opportunities for all our people. These are my humble thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Milafio Badai. Always a pleasure having uh, these discussions with you, uh, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria and a former presidential candidate. All right. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Austin Weze, um, your, your closing remarks, please. Uh, yes, uh, my uh, closing um, remarks will be that, first of all, we uh, need to uh, sort out the domestic debts. You know, the government should, as much as possible, pay off the domestic debt because once that money is paid, the money is go to the banks. Banks will have enough money to um, loan out to people to uh, uh, create uh, assets and all that. And then it has a, you know, a, a it's a, like a cycle comes back to the system. All right. Secondly, you know. The, as a student and a teacher of political economy, we cannot talk of economy without talking about the politics of it. And um, we need to sort our politics out. The economy will only grow and be reflected if the political side is also taken care of. So it's not isolated. They go together. Okay? As we are sorting out the economy, has a way of influencing the, uh, the economy. And again, we also need to um, uh, look at the, um, you know, the the, the unemployment, uh, 33 percent, is the adult unemployment. The youth unemployment is higher, so we have to look at, you know, ways and be more strategic. We don't have a strategy. Okay, we know, you know, that Nigeria's economy is about 79 percent of West Africa's economy. So where are the products coming from? Obasan just tried in 2007 to give some grants to some companies to reduce their factories to produce for exports so that we can end foreign exchange. Because once we have foreign exchange coming in, okay, then you so but when Yaradua came in, President Yaradua of the best of memory, he canceled that project. And those companies uh, you know lost money which they had used to return their this thing. So we should be strategic in, in, the, in the sense that we should focus on areas, you know, uh, where we have the productive, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, we can be more productive yes. and produce for export as well as domestic uh, this thing. Because inflation, I have no problem with inflation <laughs> because yes. once the domestic uh, production Dr. is Wayne, high, yeah. inflation will automatically be taken care of in the long run. In the short run, yes. So yeah. these are my thoughts. Dr. Mweze, uh, fantastic place to, uh, to end the conversation. Th thank you so much for your time with us on the show, Dr. Austin Mweze, uh, lecturer at Pan-African University uh, here in Lagos. Thank you for your time. Always a pleasure having you talk to us. Okay, let's wrap up this conversation. A pleasure. With, uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, Justin Chukwu. A quick one, Johnson. Uh, 
are there anything that uh, monetary policy uh, parameters, decisions can do at the moment as a quick fix? Uh, there, are not, there are not many things or much that uh, the monetary policies can do. If we have to address the debt burden or the debt profile, the government has to review its approach to funding infrastructure. As it stands today, the government don't have, does not have the revenue to fund infrastructure. If you just look back at 2020, total federal government revenue was 3.4 trillion naira. Government spent 3.1 trillion naira to service debt mm. as at the end of November. So leaving only 300 billion for recurrent expenditure and capital expenditure. Government spent 4 trillion naira on recurrent expenditure as at the end of November. And total capital expenditure was 1.2 trillion naira. Government borrowed 5.3 trillion naira last year to basically pay salaries, salaries and wages. And of that 5.3 trillion naira, only 1.2 trillion naira as of November was invested in infrastructure. In effect, we are borrowing not to build infrastructure. Mm. And as it stands today, every cobalt in Nigeria that is invested in infrastructure is borrowed. And the government is not the most efficient uh, um, a deployer yeah, or user manage, of economic manager, yeah. resources or manager economic resources. So if government must borrow to build infrastructure, why don't we leave that borrowing or those infrastructure development to the private sector? And then reduce the debt burden the federal government is carrying. Yeah. Because when government borrows, there's a lot of wastages built into government expenditure. And we can eliminate that by allowing private sector. Because in the, in the first place, we are not funding it from budgetary allocation. We are funding from borrowing. And that's something we have for 2021 budget. So as it stands today, government doesn't have revenue to build infrastructure from cap budgetary allocation. Let's bring in private sector, identify commercially viable and uh, economically, Structure, if, economically effective corridors or infrastructure that you can concession to private sector to build on that build operate and transfer. Mm -hmm. We will still enjoy the benefit of those things and people will pay token as taxes to use or, or right. tariffs to use those for infrastructure mm -hmm. right. than what we have today. All right. Thank you very much, Johnson Chuka. Always a pleasure. I mean it was worth the wait. Johnson Chuka Financial Analyst MD Kari Assets. Thank you very much for joining us on News Hub. My pleasure. <laughs> And all the gentlemen on the other side, I'm aware you're still there. You're still listening. Thank you very much for your time with us on the show. And all our listeners and all our callers, thank you so very much uh, for your time. We'll repeat this again tomorrow. Rather, our news up will come your way again tomorrow, same time, same station. Once again, I am David Obama. But you can, like I always say, with a job, still wear a mask. Have a great day. Mm.